ask Becky to start the recording and we can get going. Thanks for joining us all today and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Donnie, and welcome everyone to COSA's March member webinar. Um, we have a large list of panelists today and a lot to cover. If you'll go to the next slide, please. We're, um, uh, the title of our webinar today is All Politics Aside, Archivists Collaborating for Advocacy. And uh, we have several groups represented today. We're going to, we're mainly focusing on the uh, Council of State Archivists, National Association of Archives and Records Administrators, and Society of American Archivists Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness. But we also have guests from advocacy groups within COSA, NAGARA, SAA, and the Regional Archival Associations Consortium. And I do apologize to those of you who joined us a little early because you saw the great example of our collaboration and how much fun we were having getting ready for the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, today we have, there's our long list of the people who are going to be talking today. I'm your moderator. I'm formerly from the Kentucky State Archives and now at the Library of Virginia. I'm a member, I'm a COSA representative to the Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness and the, a member of the COSA Advocacy Committee as well as a member of the SAA Committee on Advocacy and Public Policy. And I'm going to go basically in the order of our speakers and that's the order they're going to speak in and then we will let you know when we have a transition so you actually know who you're listening to. Um, Jim Corridan, the State Archivist of Indiana, is the chair of the COSA Advocacy Committee and also the chair of the Joint Working Group. Kathleen Rowe and Christine Garrett are the co-chairs of the State Electronic Records Initiative Siri Advocacy and Outreach Committee. Kathleen's from the New York State Archives and Christine's from the Georgia Archives. Harry Swift from the Ohio Attorney General's Office is the NAGARA president. Um, Val Wood from the, uh, well, she's from the San Diego Recorder's Office, is one of NAGARA's representatives to the Joint Working Group. Kayla Harris from the Clinton County, Ohio Records Management is one of NAGARA's Joint Working Group members. Erin Laramore from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro is the Vice Chair of the SAA Committee on Public Awareness, or COPA, and she's one of SAA's Joint Working Group members. Tonya Zanish Belcher from Wake Forest University is the Chair of the SAA Committee on Advocacy and Public Policy, or CAP. Wendy Hagemeyer is from the George Institute of Technology, and she's the Chair of SAA's Issues and Advocacy Roundtable. And Mary Rubin is an advocacy committee member with the Regional Archival Associations Consortium, also known as RAC. Next slide, please. And today's agenda, you can see, is also long, sort of concomitant with the speakers that we have uh, involved. We're going to sort of cover the advocacy landscape. We're going to look at what COAST is doing, what NAGARA does, and what SA does individually first through COSA's Advocacy Committee, COSA's Siri Advocacy and, Aware and Outreach Committee, through NAGARA's work on advocacy and partnerships, and SAA's three different committees or roundtables, COPA, CAP, and Issues and Awareness, and then RAC's Advocacy Subcommittee. So we're going to talk about all those separately, basically. And then we're going to cover, oh, probably the last 20 years of advocacy and a five-minute discussion to delve into a little bit of the history of what we've been doing together. And then we will focus on the work of the Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness to, to sum up what we're doing together in the formal group of Joint Working Group. And now I'll turn it over to Jim, who's the chair of the COSA Advocacy Committee and also the Joint Working Group. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, and I want to start off by talking about some of the things that the Council of State Archivists are working on through their advocacy efforts. Um, just recently, COSA has joined the board of the National Coalition for History, their policy board, and so that gives COSA and SAs also on that board, um, the two archival groups, an opportunity to weigh in on issues that are affecting historical organizations in Washington, D.C. and with Congress. COSA continues to educate decision makers on the need for additional resources 
um, the COSA Advocacy Committee um, with help from um, both Barbara Teague, Sarah Koontz, and myself, as well as Patricia uh, Mansfield-Smith from Utah. Uh, Sarah's from North Carolina, which I forgot to mention. And also um, Steve Murray from Alabama all worked with members of Congress um, just last week while, we were, while the COSA board was out there and um, really made some strides, we think, with some key players in trying to help them understand the issues being faced by the states and the need for more resources. And lastly, um, we had a briefing last week in Washington, D.C., where we talked about advocacy among a number of issues and made some inroads, I think, with some allied organizations who are willing to help us and support some things that we're doing, um, including some joint statements. We were also pleased to reinforce that in last year, last year, uh, the COSA board, the awards committee, and then the advocacy committee all came together and wanted to recognize the efforts of Leslie Reynolds, who was the executive director of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and Doug Robinson, who is the executive director of the National Association of State Chief CIOs, for their efforts in helping COSA and state archives um, in their advocacy efforts uh, through their connections with those two associations. Next slide, please. And I would now like to introduce Kathleen Rowe from the New York State Archives and Christine Garrett from the um, Georgia State Archives, who are co-chairs of Series Advocacy and Outreach Committee. Thank you. This is Christine in Georgia. And as he said, I'm a co-chair along with Kathleen Rowe in New York. We have seven committee members in addition to ourselves. And if you listen today and decide this is something that interests you, we can still have people sign up because we just got started working. Either contact us or put in the chat or Q&A that you're interested, and we will sign you right up. When Kathleen and I were given the list of objectives for our subcommittee to achieve, it was a really long list. And we decided that there was no way we could address all of them at once and give every single one the attention that they needed. So we're focusing on just three, and those are the three that you see on the screen. The first is to raise awareness of State Archives electronic records initiatives and challenges. And we plan to do this through social media blast using Twitter, Facebook, on various days throughout the year. The days tend to be focused with, elect with records centric, like uh, May Day, Clean Off Your Desk Day, Sunshine Week. We're compiling a list based off of one that we've created by the old Ferry Governance Subcommittee in refining it. We hope to get started in April and getting those announcements out. We're working on details, whether it's just our committee or if we're going to work with states and archival professions to also use their social media to get out the message. But if you have anything you would like us to share or to put on a social media blast, let us know. It could be something you're doing that you want advertised, or if it's something that you think the rest of us would benefit from knowing about, we'd really appreciate hearing about it. The second item is the State of State Electronic Records Report. Like the first item, this is something that's still in its early developmental stage. We've narrowed down our audience from everybody down to State Archives employees, professional archival groups, our content providers, and state government associations, such as NASIO and NAS. We haven't quite figured out how the content will be presented and what that content will be. We're not sure if we're the ones gathering all the information, creating the report. We know we're the ones advocating for it. We just don't know our entire role for the report. But as you can see from the first two items, we're still really early in our work, so it's not too late to sign up. And I will turn it over to Kathleen, who will talk about Electronic Records Day. Hi, thank you, Christine. Um, Electronic Records Day has been going on um, under the auspices of, of the Council of State Archivists since 2012. It's during um, American Archives Month, and it's on the 10th day, so we have the, the uh, good old computer 1010. Um, we use it really as an opportunity to reach out to our professional colleagues and to records creators so we can remind and we can inform them of the importance of electronic records. It's just a really good sort of um, 
point where we can all, all do the same thing. Uh, we initially started out with some very simple things like a one-page tip sheet, um, saying this is why electronic records are important, this is, this is information you need to know if you have or create or use electronic records, and we aim that at our state government colleagues. We've expanded beyond then that um, and enlisted other organizations to share this own information. So in the past two years, it's not just COSA and our members pushing out the information about the importance of paying attention to electronic records and their issues, but we've also um, seen the National Archives participate with this. NAGARA and, and SAA have both uh, shared information and, and some of their members have been involved. And we've also moved beyond our professional organizations to some very closely related and, and professional organizations for whom electronic information is important, including the National Association of Chief Information Officers, NASIO, the National Association of Secretaries of State, um, and even last year the National Genealogical Society, the Sunlight Foundation, Family Search, and some of the ARMA International champ chapters have also been involved. So it's been a really good and growing effort. Last year we had a poster, this year, um, and we used a theme of the importance of dealing with electronic mail, which you all know um, from from the from the campaigns, is important at the federal level as well as as in our states and, and localities. So we're going to continue working through that. Chris Stenson from Oregon has been leading this effort, and will continue to do so. And uh, so look for coming in in October more information and and more ways to participate in Electronic Records Day. So that's the basics of, of where we're at and how we're continuing to, to build um, the advocacy and outreach for electronic records. And that being said, I will turn the uh, participant microphone over to Perry Swift, the president of NAGARA, who is from the Ohio Attorney General's Office. There you Thanks, go, Perry. <clears throat> well, NAGARA's current mission, I think, speaks a lot to our advocacy efforts because our current mission is to provide a common forum and tools, networking and training opportunities that foster member success. And that's really where NAGARA directs its advocacy efforts. Um, we really want to focus on our members and their success. And we do this through three main channels, the first of which is partnerships with a variety of organizations, um, some of which are on the phone with us today, uh, but we partner with archives and records associations such as COSA, SAA, and ARMA. We have also recently started entering into partnerships with some of the certifying bodies. Um, so the Institute of Certified Records Managers, we have a partnership with now, and um, they're partnering with us uh, on our annual meeting this summer. And we are working on something very similar that we hope to have in place soon with the Academy of Certified Archivists as well. And additionally, we have other government associations, uh, NAS has already been mentioned, but we've also teamed up with the International Institute of Municipal Clerks to develop and edit some technical leaflets on archives and records management topics. Um, next slide, please. So in many cases, our programming is very purposefully designed to be broader than our membership. Um, we think that this naturally increases the audience of our advocacy efforts. And in part, this may have to do with, I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but uh, sometimes the government sector has this reluctance to accept the word of their knowledgeable, educated employee. Um, but there's this unique phenomenon that if you bring in somebody else from another jurisdiction uh, to convey the same information or message, those ears tend to perk up. So if in some way NAGARA can be that other organization uh, to get the message of archives and records across, we would like to do that. One of the ways we do that is through uh, regional records forums. A lot of times these are going to be electronic records forums. The topic's up to the host. Uh, it can run the gamut of a little bit of everything to um, maybe particularly focused on e-discovery or other electronic records topics. Uh, we've also done some judicial records forums that specifically focus on court records and what we need to be aware of when taking care of and producing court records. Um, these are, you know, we work with our host agency to specialize the curriculum and develop it around what they feel that their audience needs. And we feel like this, you know, gets us into a region where people might not necessarily have the budget to do a whole lot of traveling, but if we can make it a single day event where you don't have to have hotel expenses or anything like that, um, it's helpful. 
So registration fees cover all the costs of these annual records forums. And the third way that we advocate is through our annual conferences. These are attended by members, our partner associations, local government, uh, both officials and employees. We do a lot of activities um, throughout the annual conferences. It's, it's about learning, but we also feel like our conferences as a whole are very much designed to advocate and to raise awareness and visibility of the host organization. Um, it's important that people see the good work that they're doing in, in a profession like ours. If we're doing our jobs right, we're not necessarily in the news. We're not necessarily being seen, but it's important to be seen. And so, you know, when we invite an elected official or somebody to come and talk at our opening breakfast, it's not just about bringing them in, but it's really about them seeing what the host organization is doing, what NAGARA is doing, what all the attendees are doing, and how important the work that we do is. And we really feel like this raises awareness in a very different way. So whether it's through our e-records forums, through the technical leaflets, annual conference, through our partnerships, each of our members we feel like can walk away with tools that they can use to further their success and to champion the cause of records management and archives. Um, therefore, NAGARA advocacy isn't so much about a process or a procedure or a policy, but it's more about doing these three things that we do well, continuing to grow them, which is partnerships, our records forums, and our annual conferences. So now I'm going to turn it over to Erin Laramore of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Hi there. I'm um, going to talk to you a little bit about the work of the Committee on Public Awareness, which is within SAA. Um, we're a group that was formed in mid-2014, and we kind of had two charges. One was to provide information to SAA Council um, in order to kind of enhance SAA's ability to promote the value of archives and archivists. The other was working with SAA staff to develop programs to promote the value and roles of archives and archivists nationwide. Um, just as one little note, we're distinguished from CAP, which is another SAA committee you'll learn about in a minute, by virtue of our audience um, who we're seeking to reach or influence. COPA is looking at the general public or stakeholder groups that are other than legislators and politicians for the most part. So our membership consists of eight members, plus uh, two ex officios and two SA staff liaisons. Our membership represents a broad range of archives from academic to state government, museum, and business. We've done um, a few smaller projects, including Ask an Archivist Day on Twitter and surveying the SA website to look for information that we can use to kind of create a public-facing section of the SA website, something that um, non-archivists could look at to learn what it is that archivists do. Um, but our biggest project to date has been the Archives Aware blog, and you see the link to the blog there um, on the screen. The blog um, was launched January 2016, so just a few months ago. It's intended to be an online space where professionals and students engaged in all aspects of archival work can share their experiences and ideas related to raising public awareness of archives and the value that archives and archivists bring in any sector, in government, um, business, education, and society as a whole. We've got nine posts so far, um, including ones on um, the SA Business Section's advo Advocacy Toolkit, the role of innovation in outreach, and engaging undergraduate students with archives. And so far to date, we've got about um, 3,500 unique visitors who've visited the site since its January launch. So next up is Tanya Zanich belcher from the SA's Committee on Advocacy and Public Policy. Thanks, Erin, and thanks for having me as part of this webinar on behalf of SAA's Committee on Advocacy and Public Policy, also known as CAP. I am currently chairing CAP, and the committee includes 14 members, um, including ex officios, SAA staff, and then representatives from government and university archives. CAP's charge was um, redefined in 2013, and its role is to provide strategic information and advice to SAA Council in addressing public policy issues and concerns. Our work is guided by SAA's public policy agenda, and while I won't list every area covered, it is on the SAA website, 
I would pr prioritize the following, um, ensuring the transparency and accountability of government at all levels, ensuring the protection of citizens' rights and individual privacy, and preserving historical documentation for the next generation, and that's just a few. Um, CAP helps, helps SAA craft different kinds of responses, uh, such as issue briefs, position statements, and letters. Requests come to us in a variety of ways and are written and drafted by a variety of authors. Um, our main accomplishments of the last couple years have been to develop a workflow, uh, creating a foundation of eight briefs and five statements, and providing guidelines for anyone that wants to request SAA take an action. Issue briefs require the most intensive work as they include background, connection with the SAA strategic plan, current issues, and SAA action items. Um, one of the most important things CAP um, has learned over the past two years is the importance of collaboration and information gathering. Uh, much of our time is spent conducting research, talking with impacted archives, and collaborating with other allied groups, such as the joint um, working group with COSA and Nagera, but also internal SAA groups, such as the Intellectual Property Working Group and the Issues and Advocacy Roundtable. We also communicate with archivists involved in local situations because there are times when SAA's assistance is not necessarily wanted. Um, and our work is in close collaboration with SAA's president, executive director, executive director, executive committee, and or council. Okay, next slide. Um, the next slide details some of our more recent briefs. Again, done in conjunction with the Joint Working Group and IPWG, both of which I mentioned previously. I won't discuss each of these specifically, but thought it might also be of interest uh, that we developed a one-page handout by request of the SAA office for the express purpose of providing an easy source of information and handout for legislators. Um, some of the issues that we are currently working on right at this moment include letters and statements, several again in collaboration in regards to the LA Port Authority archives closure, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and the issue of Rip Levin for state records in California. Finally, we are working on an issue brief, um, Archivists and Climate Change, uh, brought forward by Project ARC, the archivists responding to climate change. At this point in time, the SAA action items have been completed and reviewed by a number of different groups, uh, but we are still researching and writing the background issues and citations. Um, and I do hope to have that before council. I'd really hope to have it before them um, for the May meeting, but it's probably looking more like August, but I'm hoping to get, at least get a preliminary review in May. Um, some of the other issues currently being brought to our attention or prioritized as something CAP may in consider and investigate include uh, congressional records as public records, guns in the reading room, which is coming out of Texas, uh, records retention schedules in the Chicago Police Department, and the public record status of police body cam video. Um, next slide, please. Finally, I would like to close with two links which may be of interest. The first describes the circumstances under which SAA will take a position, make a statement, or take another action, um, and notes that our focus is responding to issues that um, issues that are specifically related to archives and archival functions. Um, but I think because you just heard my list of current issues, it is pretty obvious that practically everything happening in the world today has an archives connection. I'm also providing a link on how to request an advocacy action from SAA. These guidelines describe how you actually bring an issue forward, how to create a research overview, which then allows CAP and SAA Council and SAA staff to determine how to proceed and then what happens afterward. So I'm going to turn this over now to Wendy Hagenmeyer from Georgia Institute of Technology, who is the current chair of SAA's Issues and Advocacy Roundtable. Thanks, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Wendy. I'm the chair of SAA's Issues and Advocacy Roundtable, um, which I affectionately call INA. Um, INA is a forum for a discussion of the critical issues facing the archival profession. We have over 640 members from SAA and beyond. Our group is committed to outreach and advocacy efforts that support the continued growth of the archival profession and nurture arch archivists and archives. Our core values are advocacy, awareness, diversity, education, and dialogue. Um, I want to share information about some of our recent activities, and we invite your participation in all of these efforts. And if you have any ideas for ways we could collaborate, please let me know. We'd love to do so. 
So in January of this year, we launched seven INA research teams, um, which are groups of dedicated volunteers who monitor breaking news and delve into ongoing topics affecting archives and the archival profession. Each team is led by a member of the INA steering committee, and their ultimate goal is to compile their findings into journalistic research posts for the INA blog. Uh, each research post offers a summary and coverage of an issue, and we hope that taken together, the research post will offer an important overview overview of issues affecting archives and the profession and serve as an informational resource for, for the research, for advocacy action, uh, and for the historical record. Um, research posts and the work of the teams may, in, may inspire uh, issues and advocacy polls, which could take the pulse of SA members on a specific issue, advocacy overviews, which are detailed summaries of issues that provide SA leadership with information they need in order to determine whether it's appropriate for SAA to assist with an issue, letters to the editor, and also collaborations with SA leadership and other groups within SAA. So we had 87 volunteers for the research teams within about a 48-hour period, so we were really excited for the enthusiasm, um, and we were able to accommodate 42 volunteers. We're treating these teams as a pilot that will run through the SA annual meeting, and we're hopeful that this uh, will provide a model um, of an effective way of mobilizing a large portion of our membership and beyond to engage in work that supports advocacy. Um, three of the research teams are doing research on recent legislative activity in order to identify potential allies for, um, for archives in Congress. Two teams are agile on-call teams who can be mobilized to quickly investigate issues as they arise. One team is monitoring the communications of other professional associations for issues related to archives. And the final team is monitoring news media in general for issues related to archives. We also recently launched a WordPress site to create a flexible online presence uh, that provides a forum for dynamic content and discussion. Our vice, vice chair, Christine George, has uh, been organizing a very successful series of blog posts called Archivists on the Issues, which features personal reflections from individual archivists about issues facing the profession. And we'll also soon feature posts by the research teams and updates about advocacy talks and events. Uh, in addition, we're excited to have become a part, begun a partnership with uh, Mary Rubin, and you'll hear from Mary during the next slide, um, and Andrew Noga from the Regional Archival Association's Consortium Advocacy Subcommittee to revise the Issues and Advocacy Toolkit, which is available on our site. And we'll soon be announcing a survey to gather ideas for the toolkit, and we'd love to have your participation uh, so we can work together to create a rich resource for all of our groups. We also welcome your nominations, and it's just a very quick online form um, for great advocates, um, individuals in the archives profession whose advocacy efforts you admire. We're organizing an interactive Q&A session with great advocates to take place during the uh, INA gathering at the SA annual meeting in August, so please nominate someone. Our overall goal this year has been really just to establish sustainable, mo uh, productive models of advocacy practice that engage our membership broadly and also support the advocacy mission of SAA. To that end, we've been encouraging conversation and information sharing among all of the various SAA groups engaged in advocacy. And now I'd like to introduce Mary Rubin of the University of Central Florida, who is a member of the Regional Archival Association's Consortium Advocacy Subcommittee. Thank you, Wendy. The Regional Archival Associations Consortium, known as RAC, is composed of 46 professional regional and archival associations at the local, state, and multi-state level. I've provided a condensed version of RAC's mission, which includes advocacy as a key component. The need for increased collaboration around advocacy was one of the primary reasons for establishing RAC. Advocacy is currently one of RAC's main focus areas, along with disaster planning and recovery, education, grant development, and public awareness. Next slide, please. Last year, RAC formulated two goals pertaining to both advocacy and collaboration. The first was to establish formal communication lines through which regional organizations can ask for advocacy assistance and report local advocacy issues to SAA. The second was to establish a formal procedure between RAC and SAA so the regional organizations can learn about the issues on which SAA has released a statement so they can follow suit if interested. When a local advocacy issue arises, we would like to be able to mobilize the regional organizations and potentially other national groups, such as SAA, to lend support to a regional organization's advocacy campaign, provide assistance disseminating information to other regionals, issue statements, and so much more. 
To this end, an advocacy protocol was created to be clear about what can be expected when requesting advocacy assistance. While this is established already, RAC is currently standardizing a forum for such requests, as well as developing transparency protocols for any issues brought forward, which are part of this year's goals. Conversely to the advocacy protocol, SAA may contact RAC to ask for advocacy assistance. The creation of a memorandum of understanding is currently in progress between RAC and SAA. Since both RAC and the advocacy protocol that we established last year are relatively new, we are working to ensure that all regionals know about the advocacy assistance that RAC can provide. We hope that in the future, when a regional is faced with an archives advocacy issue, that the mechanisms that we have in place will provide the help that is so often needed. RAC is open to other collaborative efforts with other groups to further develop a framework for helping regionals with local advocacy issues. One project that's currently in the works, as Wendy mentioned, is between RAC and SAA's Issues and Advocacy Roundtable that is uh, the fur further development of INA's Advocacy Toolkit to highlight the advocacy-related work that regionals have undertaken throughout the country. Thank you for your time today, and now back to Barbara Teague. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, and thanks so much to all of our other speakers who really aren't COSA members but took the time to work with us on this webinar so that we could show you the impressive array of groups who are working together on archival advocacy. Um, we've given you a overview of what we're doing now. We wanted to go back and just look at some things that we had done in the past together before we get to our uh, joint working group and what we're working on uh, this year. Um, we did some, the first thing we could find that we're actually working on together, of course, is some uh, action alerts that Kathleen Rowe was sending out before 2004 about NHPRC being zero budgeted. But we, we really worked very closely when the Archivist of the United States position was open in 2004 and again in 2008, and also a statement on hurricane, hurricane relief that we did jointly. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we had a lot of, uh, we learned our, we learned a lot about advocacy when NHPRC was either zeroed out or reduced in the president's budget. We had a lot of action alerts that came from our leader in archival advocacy, Kathleen Rowe, who also brought in some help from uh, the New York State Education Department, Washington representative, and Cynthia Woodside, and a pro bono attorney who helped us and gave us some advice. And it's sort of fitting that we're actually talking about advocacy here in our March webinar because Kathleen is retiring from the New York State Archives this end of a week from yesterday, I believe. Make sure she's muted because I'm going to say something about her. Um, <laughs> she, uh, I think we really need to acknowledge her role as the leader and really the original Kickstarter for getting archivists involved in advocacy for the past decade. Uh, if you think about all she did for us, she wrote numerous action alerts. Um, she she did a lot of thinking about what we needed to say. She uh, sent the alerts to us and guided us in contacting our representatives. She helped uh, conceive the funding idea and the ask for the partnership for the American Historical Record, and she led the part legislative effort. She trained probably most of us here and many of us who aren't here in groups and advocacy workshops and webinars. She listened to many panicked calls from us and provided experienced and wise counsel to us and even accompanied us to visit our own congressional representatives. I can attest to that. She walked me to the door. <laughs> this was my first congressional visit. Um, Kathleen, I think all of us here today are really, really owe you in getting us started on advocacy, and you can see the fruits of your work from what you, from this webinar sort of shows what you got us started on and how we're all taking it and running with it. So thanks. You 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 can't you can't mute me. I just want to say, I, number one, I am not dead, <laughs> but it sounded I like I was getting there. And number two, I the only reason I was at the front of that of it is because I have the highest genetic component of nagging skills. There were tons of people involved, and many of them are on this call, and none That's of it true. would have happened without them. That's true, but we're we're acknowledging you as our leader. Barbara, we'll, we'll have this argument later. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll Everybody else can listen to this, the rest of it. Thanks. 
That was okay. very kind of you. Thank you. And this uh, one of the things that Kathleen worked on with several people, we had representatives from COSA, Nagara, and SAA working on a PAR, a partnership for the American Historical Record Committee, that worked on strategizing for how we were going to get a $50 million uh, funding, block grant funding to the states. And we found when we were doing uh, congressional visits for that, that a lot of people in Congress call 50 million decimal dust. So we're, it was pretty interesting to find that out. But we did a great job of getting a lot of sponsors, and SAA still maintains our PAR uh, page, and the link is there, and it's available, so you can see how many sponsors we had at one time. In 2013, we were sort of advised that because of the contentious, uh, the contentious behavior of Congress that it really wasn't the best time to go ahead and ask for another funding for a new program, but to keep on doing what we were doing, educating legislators, honing our message, and getting ready for the next ask. So I think that's the stage that we're in now. Next slide, please. One of the things we also did, um, which was pretty interesting, I know the National Archives has been called for a lot of hearings, but there was one hearing about the NHPRC where COSA, Nagara, and SAA were all asked to testify. And I will mention that Kathleen was also there holding our hand and making sure that we made it through this, this hearing. This was our, one of our first uh, uh, experiences with Representative Jason Chaffetz from Utah, who really didn't like the NHPRC. We had a lot of interesting questions from the rest of the panel, and we hope that we provided some information about NHPRC. Our panel of the grant recipients really made some important points about archives changing lives, creating jobs, and documenting matters of life and death. So we, we thought we did a really good job. Um, and now I will note we've reviewed sort of what we did before, before we got to the Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness and started having a formal way to work together. This is, uh, I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about what we are doing now and how we're working together in our, our working group. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so the, the Joint Working Group on Issues and Awareness uh, was basically started or began, the formation of a, in at least its most recent version, began in December of 2012 in Annapolis, Maryland when the COSA board was having its mid-year meeting and we invited members of both SAA and NAGARA um, to attend so that we could talk about trying to coordinate advocacy efforts. And a couple of years later, we pulled that together. The three groups continued their discussions. And then when Sarah Kuntz and, uh, from North Carolina, Tanya Marshall from Vermont, and Kathleen Rowe were all presidents of their respective organizations, as listed on this slide, um, they formed, they jointly formed the committee. And so Barbara Teague and I are representing COSA, and there's other members on this, on this thing, as you saw earlier, that represent the different organizations. And so all of us um, have been working together for the last year and a half, trying to make sure that we're working together and um, through that strength and cooperation, I think we're getting much further and it carries much more weight when we say the national uh, archival organizations are in agreement on these issues. So we're pleased to see that kind of effort coming out of this committee. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we're coordinating efforts and initiatives of, of those three organizations, and um, also common concerns and actions, things like um, public policy and legislative concerns at the federal level, occasionally at the state level, um, cooperating on efforts to raise awareness of the value of archives. And so it's just not simply straightforward advocacy, but also making sure that we're educating lawmakers, whether they're state, legislative, and even creating materials, hopefully, this is where we're headed, creating materials that can be used by local governments so that people understand the significance of maintaining and preserving local records and not keeping them in moldy basements somewhere. Um, coordinating strategies for the preservation of and access to archival records throughout the United States, its territories, and the District of Columbia. So those are kind of our big picture things, and if you'll flip to the next slide. Um, the joint working group, as I mentioned, Barbara and I, from Nagara, we have Kayla Harris, who's on the call today with us from Clinton County, Ohio, and Val Wood, who I think will be speaking in a minute, um, from San Diego County, Aaron Laramore, you heard from earlier, and from UNC Greensboro, um, and then also just named by SAA this week is Tanya, who's been speaking with us, who will be representing um, CAP, 
and so we're happy to have her join us. And we have former members, Michael Sherman from Nagara and Amy Lazarus from SAA, who did a tremendous amount of work in pulling things together and creating pages for us to work from, and so we're appreciative of her efforts in the past as well. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to introduce my colleague Val Wood from um, Nagara, who, all, and, um, who will be talking about what we're doing going forward in our work plan. Valerie? Oh, hi. Uh, the joint group working group has six main strategies. I'll be speaking to the first three, which are focused mainly on monitoring, coordinating action for ongoing issues and funding on um, federal programs. So specifically, we focus a lot on the NHPRC, as you've heard about so far this afternoon, um, a lot about, and also NARA and NEH. And also, we look at promoting professional standards and best practices for public records. You'll, you'll hear some of that in a, in a couple more slides as we talk about the work group statements that have been issued on standards and be best practices for records issues. And now Kayla Harris from the Clinton County Ohio Records Management will speak to the second set of three strategies for the work group. Okay, so on this slide we have the remainder of our work plan, including to monitor and coordinate strategies for federal, state, and local issues that threaten our, um, our field, to coordinate efforts to raise awareness of the value of a profession in our work so that we can promote what we're all doing, and lastly, to coordinate strategies for the preservation of and access to archival records throughout the U.S. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about our work products as I turn it back over to Erin. Thank you. Um, so you see on the screen there a number of the issue briefs and joint letters and joint statements that we as a committee have um, crafted or worked on at, in, at some level. Um, what we're trying to do here is we're aiming to create a unified voice on a number of important and broad-reaching professional issues. Um, these statements, most of them, not all, but most of them are signed by all three organizations, SA, COSA, and NAGARA. Um, the most recent statement, which you actually see there at the bottom of the screen, the Joint Statement on Access to State and Local Records, that's one that actually focuses on the importance of timely access to government records, regardless of the type of repository um, where they're currently being held. So that's a selection, and, you know, each of those um, statements can be accessed. I think they're all on the SAA website. but. Um, you know, feel free to look over over those. And now we'll go back to Jim. Uh, thank you. And so I wanted to touch on a couple of things here about where we're headed. Um, you can see here that COSA has the um, the issue briefs, positions, and statements, as does uh, SAA, and I suspect that Nagara probably has it online also. Um, we would encourage anyone who's interested to help get involved with some of the committees and organizations and the advocacy efforts because this is really a joint effort, it truly is, and it will take all of us to make some progress. Um, as our group met with people from Washington, D.C., some of the legislative leaders, the more feedback they hear, the more they hear from the archival community, the better our chances of getting funding, the better our chances of preserving funding and changing some of the outlooks because they know there's a concerned group that wants to see some things fixed. So that can't be mentioned strongly enough. I should also mention just today, the National Coalition um, of History Policy Board was sent information about the federal budget coming out of Washington. Um, it includes um, the defunding of both NEH and IMLS, which it has included for many years recently. None, it never happens, but we should be aware of that and follow it. Uh, it's not something that we need to just start jumping out windows over, but it is a concern that Congress continues to look at defunding some of these cultural organizations which are providing funds to the archives community. Um, so with that, if you didn't get questions answered today, Barbara, do you want to chime in here? Um, sure. We're, we have time for questions, but just in case we don't have enough time or you want to volunteer for something, just send me an email and I can make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. Um, next slide, please. One more little thanks for Kathleen Rowe, um, since she's going to retire from the New York State Archives, but also going to stay involved with many of our committees, so we're happy to uh, just take what Kathleen has taught us and we've learned together along the way and we appreciate everything that you've done for us, Kathleen. Um, 
and we will take your questions. If you have any, I guess you can type them in the chat box, or uh, is it possible to unmute people if they want to talk? Yep, well, if anybody wants to talk, um, you should be able to raise your hand um, on the screen and we'll, we'll unmute you. Okay, I do or wanna... you, can, you can type in the chat or the Q&A box, either one. I do want to report, though, that Kathleen mentions that uh, this will be the last time you see her gray hair, and I think she's going to try and match the uh, color of the poster below her, that purple, for her hair. So we're looking forward to seeing you soon with that, Kathleen. And do we have any questions? Anybody see any groups they're interested in uh, joining or have any advice for any of us? I'm not seeing any questions yet, but I am sure that there will be some coming in. Sometimes it takes a while for people to get things typed in. Um, I'll ask a question. Um, Jim, will you tell us a little bit about the process that we go through in the joint working group to uh, work on an issue statement? Sure. So one of the challenges we have working with three um, independent organizations, this is the negative side, is that it sometimes takes us a while to get something done because the group, the, the representatives of the three organizations will draft something, we send it out to the boards, the boards review it, and then they'll make a change or verbiage changes or con, uh, conceptual changes, and then we have to send it back out again. So oftentimes we can't move as quickly as maybe we would like, um, but it's been a very collaborative process, and we thus far we have always gone, gotten together and figured out um, how we can get something that everyone's in agreement with. So we've been pleased with the outcomes. I see a question from Julia Young um, asking about how COSA's recent visit was, and so uh, I think on the call, Barbara and I are probably the only two people who were actually there on this call, and I can share with you that um, we met with Congressman Chaffetz's office, his chief of staff, and I would characterize the meeting as fairly positive, or even very positive, um, which was surprising. Congressman Chaffetz chairs the Oversight Committee in the House, and they have direct oversight over the National Archives as a general government agency. And so um, because of Barbara's earlier work, we were concerned that they were going to be a little hostile. I think that they were impressed that multiple states came together to meet with them, and um, we laid out the case about what archives are doing the challenges with electronic records, the fact that many archives in the country hold on to federal records, which has been one of the congressman's concerns, is why would the federal government be providing money to state governments or local units or even universities? Um, what's the purpose of just giving away grant funds? And so we explained how we're sitting on, in many cases, tremendous amounts of federal records, um, whether originally created at the state level or transferred to the states. And so we started to get some buy-in, and I think there's an opportunity here for us to do some collaboration with the congressman's office and try to see if there's a way forward working together with them to get some progress as far as what might be available to the archives community. And Barbara, do you want to chime in also on any of that? Um, I thought we had some very positive visits. We had a visit with uh, Hal Rogers' staff. He's a chair of appropriations, and it was a new person that we met with there who was pretty positive about um, looking at different ways of funding archives. She was interested in some of the projects that we talked about. Always our uh, representative from the House of Representatives, who's on the NHPRC for the House, Andy Barr from the my district, my former district of Kentucky, is very friendly and supportive of NHPRC. And we also met with uh, Senator Sullivan's office. He's the new Senate representative to the NHPRC, and they, they're very positive and happy. They have some copies of records from the National Archives in their office, and they're pretty happy about that. And we, we saw some different ways to look for funding, increased funding, at least for NHPRC for next year, a couple of different avenues to look at. And. Aaron, do you want to mention the Archives Aware blog? I see you've sent a note out, but do you want to speak to that? 
Um, I just wanted to make folks aware of the fact that we, I'm making them aware of the Archives Aware blog. Um, I wanted to make them aware of the fact that we are soliciting uh, posts from other people. We've basically got, I think, nine posts up right now, and they're all by COPA committee members, but we're actively looking for content from people who aren't on the committee. And so, um, you know, if you want to look at what's already up and see kind of the length of the post, they're usually about 500, maybe 700 words, if that long. Um, you know, if you're involved in any interesting engagement activities, um, feel free to contact us. And I think Wendy could probably talk about this a little bit better than I can, but the Issues and Advocacy Roundtable has been helping with getting members of Congress to sign on to the History Caucus. It's something that the National Council on National Coalition for History is working on, too. So if your congressional representative would be interested in that, that's a good foot in the door. And we should also probably mention um, we're happy that Lee White is here. He is the uh, executive director of the National Coalition of History, and he's, he's attending today's call. So thank you, Lee, for joining us. Okay. Um, we do have another question. In all of these advocacy efforts, are you collecting metrics to evaluate effectiveness and to adjust messages as necessary? Well, we've definitely been adjusting our message because when Kathleen Rowe began a lot of these efforts, the Democrats were in control, and when the Republicans took control, the message that we would have used the Democrat majority would not be necessarily as effective with the Republican majority. And so, and I'm talking about in Washington, obviously. And so we have been adjusting our message, which is why when we met with Chaffetz's office, Congressman Chaffetz's office, um, we talked about the things that he has raised in the past as concerns, um, you know, federal records being housed outside of Washington, D.C. kinds of issues. Uh, as far as metrics, um, that's a great question. And at this point, we aren't probably tracking any metrics that I can think of. Um, More than that, make sure we write our thank you notes. That's our good metric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be, this is Kathleen, it would be interesting to know what kind of metrics um, you're looking for. Um, it depends in part on, on you know, if, it's, if we're talking at the federal level. For example, when we did the PAR effort, how many people actually how many members signed on as supporters with the History Coalition, that's one that would be, there's a very clear metric, do they sign on to become members of the History Coalition. Impact is, is of advocacy efforts can be very difficult to, to um, measure in numerical kind of things. Um, so, so I'm not sure what kind of, of metrics the, the person asking that, and I'm sorry I've lost who asked that, um, what kind of metrics you had in mind. So I'd be interested to hear what, if you have ideas of what that would look like. Uh, as an aside, we also are joined today by Amber Farber from the American Alliance of Museums. So as you can see, this effort of broadening our community and including more groups um, to try and reach out on the cultural basis is really taking fruition here. And we're happy to be at the front end of that as the archives community. Sorry to interject there, but Kathleen. I think Kathleen used to, well, when we were doing advocacy alerts, um, Kathleen actually used to get, we asked for people to send her copies of what they sent right. to their representative or senator, and we had some way to track statistics then. Of course, that was all voluntary, where we weren't really sure if we were getting everything. Yeah, we could we could say that on this this number of people wrote to these members. It, so we we have a minimum statistic, um, um, probably not the maximum because, as Barbara said, not everybody told us what they wrote. But I did have huge files of examples of letters, et cetera, um, for various initiatives. The best statistic was the year when the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform told us we shouldn't send any more faxes because they had plenty already. This is true. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions. Nope, I don't see any at all. We do appreciate everyone joining us. Um, and 
let us know if you have any, if you think of anything later, just let me know and I'll farm it out to the person who can actually answer the question. And I'm so glad we're ending with this lovely slide for Kathleen and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, it went away. Um, thank you. Thank so God. <laughs> we really appreciate you getting us started on this efficacy road and uh, we're glad you're going to continue on it with us. So thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us today and I really can't say enough for the, our guest speakers from RAC, Nagara, and SAA for helping us with our advocacy webinar for COSA today, so thank you. I'll turn it back over to Donya. Thank you, Barbara, and again, another big thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, we do appreciate your feedback, be it good or bad, we learn from both. So if you would please fill out the evaluation that you will get um, when you close out of your webinar, we would really appreciate it. It's not very long and um, it does help us a lot with our metrics and helps us to improve and to keep bringing you the webinars that you want to hear. Um, we do have some upcoming events. We will be, again, doing our COSA Awards program. The nomination deadline is going to be May 1st, so be sure to check out the COSA Awards page on the website to find out what awards are there and watch for the COSA newsletter that will have more information on those awards. Um, as you know, one of them is the Advocacy Award that Jim mentioned earlier. So. We'll put in a plug for all of our awards now. Um, and then our upcoming COSA member webinars, April is going to be building and working with partnerships. In May, we're going to be talking about funding collaborations. And June, we'll be talking about archives collaborations with K through 12 schools. And then we do still have some upcoming COSA Preservica practical digital preservation webinars. The um, two-hour introduction will be happening, um, actually has happened in March. I'm sorry about that. They just passed. But we do have um, new ways of providing public access to your um, archive coming up on April 26th. And those are free for COSA members and are just a nominal fee for non-COSA members. Again, we always like to thank our sponsors, Ancestry, Family Search, Preservica, Apex Software, Gaylord Archival, and of course the NHPRC and IMLS, for which many of us would not be able to do the work that we're doing. So please, as always, stay connected. Check out the COSA website, our Facebook page, and our blog, and our Twitter. And be sure to check out the links for all of our partners that we've been talking about on advocacy today. A um, lot of great things going on out there. So stay connected and informed. And with this, I will say thank you for joining us and I hope you all have a very good day.